Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner podcast, uh, the podcast where we get it all together, and then sometimes we forget where we put it. Now, so usually sometimes, I say usually sometimes, like those are two, like those are the same words. I will read something, uh, you know, inspirational or something clever uh, before we get started here. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm, we're just going to get right into it. This is Mark Lesson 2, <laughs> and uh, the previous lesson was called The Beginning of the Gospel. And I was going to call this one The Herald. Um, maybe there's a better name for it. We're going to go with the Herald for now. All right, so we're going to start in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We talked about last time how um, how God's plan of redemption begins, uh, you know, millennia. Before the before Calvary, before the events of Calvary, and all throughout Scripture, God reveals more and more uh, about the plan. And uh, when you get into the Book of Daniel, He even gives you a timeline. And so, once Christ is born, the the clock starts running. And the way you know you're getting to the end of the end, the very the very last few you know days, as it turns out, the last three years of God's plan of redemption is the appearance of the herald that was promised that would go before the Lord and announce His coming. Now, have have your have your hand in Mark chapter one. We're going to run back here to Malachi 4 real quick, just to review uh, the verse that I'm talking about, because it's been a while, and uh, maybe you forgot, because certainly I forget plenty of things. Uh, Very last two verses of your Old Testament, uh, Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children of their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And so, so before the the ministry side of the Messiah's uh, uh, appearance, Advent, you're going to have this guy show up, and the Bible refers to him as Elijah. Now, this this is we're we're going to get into all that here in a second, but but uh, says the we'll, we'll read Mark here the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God as it is written in the prophets behold I will send my messenger before thy face which will prepare thy way before thee the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord make his way straight John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins man there is a lot in there we're going to cover what we can. Now, uh, so now we talked about Malachi four, and we've read a little bit out of Mark one. Uh, you're gonna, this is gonna sound like I'm getting off topic, but we, we have to cover this because this this is an essential thing that you have to get in your brain while we're going through this. Uh, jump over to Ephesians three, Ephesians three. The Bible do say, uh. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to uh, me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a few or four and f- few words, whereby when ye read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of man, of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and his prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Uh, and so we're going to stop right there. There's a semicolon. We're going to stop right there. So there's a principle laid out here uh, that the, 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 the plan of salvation, the idea that, that salvation uh, was not just an Israel thing, that it was all of mankind thing, uh, that, that, that information was available in the scriptures. And standing on this side of the cross, looking back, well, there's a lot of things we can understand that they did not understand at the time. And the principle here is that, is that when God reveals a thing, it says, uh, how that by revelation he made known unto the me the mystery. And in verse 5, when other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy uh, apostles and prophets by the Spirit. When God reveals a thing, he doesn't necessarily do it by producing something new. I mean, you have a New Testament and you, and, and you have church epistles and you have all that great stuff, one of which I just read. But when God reveals a thing, he doesn't necessarily do it by producing something new. He does it by explaining something that they already had. Um, look, look at Luke 24. Luke 24, I'm going the wrong way. You will know this as the Emmaus Road 
uh, experience or the, you know, whatever, whatever you're going to call it. Luke 24, Matthew, Mark, Luke. I'm going the wrong way. 24. And it says, uh, uh, let's see, verse 13, verse, uh, sorry, Luke 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which is from Jerusalem, about three score furlings. I've got a list here. I've got a note here in my Bible, a handwritten note that says six-ish miles. Of, I don't know where I got that information from, but there you go. So it's about six miles from, from Emmaus to Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it's like a two-hour walk. I mean, I, I can do three miles in about 45 minutes if I'm huffing it, you know. So so we'll give these guys some credit. We'll give them some time. We'll give them two. Just, let's give them two and a half hours. And they talked together of all those things which happened. It came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Now, that's strange by itself that these were disciples uh, that had seen the Lord. And now they run into him and they don't recognize him. Verse 17, he said to them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them whose name was Cleopas answered, said unto him, uh, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. And now the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which, which said he was alive. Let me hit the pause button for just a minute. Here, so here we have guys that had heard Jesus Christ say, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again on the third day. They'd heard Jesus say that more than once. He said that to them more than once. He laid that out, that timeline out more. He, he gave, he gave the, the, the he even gave the timeline in, in, in the story of the prophet Jonah. Three days, three nights, right? So not only did that happen, not only did Jesus say that over and over again on the third day, some people saw that the tomb was empty. And yet these guys are still sad. So they have, you know, the testimony of Jesus and the testimony of other disciples. And they're, that, that's still not enough. They're still sad. Uh, see, verse 24. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but, the, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus starts off this by insulting these people. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter in his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So you see right there, God did not give them anything new. He explained something that they already had. You see that again in John 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 20. Uh, John 20, where am I at? Uh, let's start at verse six. Then cometh Simon Peter following him. I, I'm assuming, uh, when these guys at the mass road are referencing that, that there were some male disciples that went down there and saw all this for themselves. They don't say that we too saw them, saw it, but they say some others of our, of, that are of our group saw it. I'm assuming this is the incident they're talking about. Uh, if you ever lay the timeline out of everybody coming and going from the grave that morning, it, it's a busy place, and it's kind of amazing that these people didn't pass each other on the road. Uh, then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see if the linen clothes lay, lie, whatever it says, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Verse 9, for as they yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So they had the information. And what they had, for whatever reason, uh, was they lacked understanding. So so th this is this, if you really take that and apply it uh, to me and to you and everybody you know, it's a little scary. See, it makes the Bible unique. Bible says the word the word, uh, word of God is quick. 
means alive, powerful, sharp in the two-edged sword. It goes on and on and on. A discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the Bible is a unique book, not in that it's just the story that it tells, but the very nature of that book separates it from the nature of every other book you've ever read. The Bible apparently decides, via the Holy Spirit, how much understanding you'll have when you sit down to read it. That's why uh, uh, scoffers will put up their own little YouTube channels and they'll, and they'll explain uh, you know, how this doesn't work out the way the Bible says it does, and this, this verse doesn't mean what they think it means. And sometimes you, you really it's a lot of time. I, I listen to stuff every once in a while, um, um, but you can't you can't dwell on it too much because it's 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 a waste of your time. You do a little bit of that, and what you realize is that grown men with PhDs don't always understand one and two syllable words that are written on a page in front of them, and you have to say, why in the world is that? Well, because you can have all the information and you could have none of the light. God destroys his enemies. God damns his enemies, not by denying them information, but by denying them understanding. I mean, the devil has access to the Bible, but there appears to be some sort of limit on his understanding. So Bible comprehension is not a, not a function of intelligence or even effort, although you should definitely you know, apply yourself, uh, but it's a function of, a heart, of heart condition. So you approach the Bible with some sort of agenda. Let's say you're uh, Martin Luther King Jr. or Michael King Jr., which was his real name. And you approach the Bible because, uh, you know, you're looking to pull a few verses out of context. You can justify some sort of social revolution with yourself at the top. Um, then that's what you're going to get. Uh, let's say you are Jim Jones and you approach the Bible uh, with some kind of hippy dippy nonsense in your heart going on in your heart. You want to build some communal thing. You want to rebuild the world and to make it a better place. Uh, God's going to deny you understanding. Uh, let's say you're you're Alexander Campbell and you're going to approach the Bible with an agenda. God's going to God's going to get you off track and you're going to wind up preaching a false gospel. Let's say you're Joseph Smith and you're just trying to find some treasure and pick up some chicks. And you approach that Bible and try to use that Bible to get that agenda done. God's going God's gonna to cook your noodle, man. God will let you get fooled. Men who are deceived want to be deceived. Okay? So, uh, so if you approach that book with an agenda, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna put yourself in the hurt locker. I, I don't know any other way to say it. So you got to be very careful. All of us have to be very careful when we approach that book and try to pull truths out of it. I've sat there and, and put whole messages together. And, you know, about, I don't know, an hour into it, realize that this is not what the Bible actually says. This is what I want it to say. I realize sometimes that I will take a, I'll have an idea, a notion in my brain, uh, what's left of it. And I will then run amok trying to find verses to prop up my idea. And that's, that's exactly backwards the way that goes. Scary, scary stuff. But back on point, um, verse 2 in Mark, Mark 1, verse 2. Well, now, now just, just file that away. All that stuff we just went through about how the Bible uh, reveals itself to people that it wants to reveal itself to based on the condition of their heart. Just file that away. That's going to become a little important later on. Okay, just just stick that in the back of your skull and uh, and all that, you know, right there behind the lyrics to Cruel, Cruel Summer by Bananarama, which is where I keep all my important information. Uh, if you've never heard of Bananarama, you didn't miss anything. I wish I could. I wish I could. I wish I could selectively purge memories, but you can't. Uh, Mark one, verse two, as is written in the prophets, plural, right? Prophets, plurals are important in your Bible. Sing, plurals and 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 uh, the opposite of plural, singulars, are very important in your Bible, and so you should you should take mind of those things. Uh, prophets, because what what it's quoting is what it's quoting is a combination uh, of two prophets. So you've got Malachi, which we've already read, and then you've got Isaiah 40. So we're going to turn to Isaiah 40. Now, I'm not saying you build a doctrine off what I'm about to say. Um, but it is interesting uh, because I believe the Bible that I have in my hand is perfect without error. I believe it retains its inspiration. I believe there's, I, I wouldn't say, you know, every 360 in the Bible is some magical thing. I don't think you can go that tight with it. I don't think that, I think the chapters and the uh, verse numbers, uh, they're very helpful. I would not go so far to say as they're inspired. 
But there's some odd things going on when you get into chapter and verse numbers. And, and, and I don't, I, you know, I'll give you an example. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah. There are 66 chapters in your Bible or 66 books in your Bible. Uh, when you have, you have 39 books in the Old Testament. Well, Isaiah 1 through Isaiah 39 deals with uh, the nation of Israel and 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 the coming kingdom and the second return of Jesus Christ and, and the disposition of the nations that encounter the, the nation of Israel. And then in Isaiah 40, the tone of Isaiah changes. Let's look at it. Uh, we'll start at verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Another sermon for another time. Verse 3, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now that's, that. so so when, 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 when John shows up, he shows up and he's, he's saying the sort of thing He's performing the role of Elijah because Elijah is to come before the coming of the Lord. And he's saying the things that, I, that, that, that Elijah is supposed to say. Chasing something down just real quick here. I mean, that's, that's wild stuff. Yeah, never mind. Um, so anyway, uh, so, so that when it says in Mark t- Mark one, it's you know prophets. It's it's a it's a it's plural. It's a combination of the prophecy in Malachi four and it's a combination of the prophecy in Isaiah forty. And um, the it, the reason is, is because it's in two different places. And you have a guy who shows up. Uh, well, tell you what, look at this. look verse verse look verse three. Mark Mark one verse three. Bible says the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. Oh, I got there. Yep. Uh, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, Judea and they of Jerusalem, and they were all baptized and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So it says he's crying in the wilderness. The wilderness is a term that's used a lot in the Bible, and it is, it is always a reference to a very specific place. So if you could picture in your mind, uh, or if you have a map in front of you, if you have a map of the nation of Israel, what you have over on your left-hand side is you have the Mediterranean Sea. And you go across the, uh, you know, go across, the, you hit the, the beach there at the Mediterranean Sea, and you go, you know, left to right towards uh, uh, east, uh, west to east. And, uh, and what you'll go, if you go across, you'll hit the River Jordan, and then, you know, Sea of Galilee is at the top, River Jordan, uh, uh, Dead Sea is at the bottom, and the River Jordan connects those two things. That area on the other side of Jordan is what the Bible calls over and over again the wilderness. And um, when the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt, they came up, they went the long way around. They went around the bottom of the Dead Sea, or sort of on the on the, on the, on the uh, east side of the De- Dead Sea, and that, that it says that that you know God fed them with manna in the wilderness. So if you want to figure out where the wilderness ends, you have to figure out where God stopped feeding them manna. If you go over to the Book of uh, Joshua, I believe it is, um, you'll find that that w- the the last time they ate manna was on right there up against the east side of the River Jordan. Okay, so a lot of strange things happen on the other side of that river. And, uh, yeah, lots of interesting things happen. So, so, but anyway, we'll get back to maybe that, maybe that's, maybe that's something we can chase some other time. But John's message to the people is, prepare ye. And that's important because that means they have a role uh, to play in making, making his path straight. Right, it says, prepare ye the way, Lord, make his path straight. So there's a path the Lord is going to try and you have responsibility to make that path straight. That's that's interesting, as a, as a standalone statement. Uh, he's saying that to the people, but that message is also to himself because he's a, he's a, he's a person. Uh, let's look 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 one. So John stands there on the east side of the Jordan River, baptizing people in the wilderness. 
So when, so when Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, he goes over to the east side of the river Jordan. Uh, when uh, I mean, a lot of things happen. So when Jesus Christ comes back, well, another sermon for another time. I believe, and I think I think I can take a Bible and prove this, just to just to put this out there. I believe when the Antichrist attacks Jerusalem, he follows the same path that Nebuchadnezzar took when he when he attacked Jerusalem. I believe when Jesus Christ returns to Jerusalem, he takes the same path that Joshua took coming across the River Jordan. Hasn't happened yet. Not interested in arguing about it, but it's there. Luke 1, verse, Luke 1 is a long chapter, verse 76. Uh, man, there's a bunch going on in Luke 1. Okay, 76. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. So this is, this is, uh, oh boy. All right. So get, <laughs> uh, this is, uh, this is someone speaking to John. How about that? Okay. And thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God whereby the day spring from on high hath, hath visited us, to give light in the sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that's John's ministry. John's ministry is to go and talk to the people of Israel and to go speak to them. And, 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 and his, his job is to go, uh, go to speak to the people, and their job is to respond to what is said. They have responsibility in all this. They're not, you know, Christianity is, is not a spectator sport. If a man is fulfilling his responsibility to preach, uh, then you have a responsibility to act on what's said. But the interesting thing about verse 79, you look at it real quick here, uh, to give light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. Just, just, just jump over to Acts 26 for a minute. Acts 26. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. Or this is Apostle Paul speaking, is quoting Jesus Christ. Uh, and I said, uh, verse 15, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, look at the next verse, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified uh, by faith that is in me. So, different ministry, but a very similar commission. Now, I'm going to throw an idea out there to you because uh, it, it's got to be covered at some point. I'll just say it, and you can you can agree or disagree, or whatever. Uh, when you when you you get get your Bible, you're sitting there, you're holding it in your hand. And you see, uh, you have you see a division. Uh, you have a bunch of books that say the Old Testament, you know, and then you have a like you know a blank page or whatever, and then you have a thing that says the New Testament. And that's I, I know why we do that. That's not technically accurate. Okay, so the Book of Hebrews says that the the Testament is of, is of no effect until the death of the testator. So so the plan of salvation doesn't do you any good until Christ dies and is buried and rises again from the third day, because that's the thing that sets the, all the stuff in motion. That's the thing that makes that thing happen. So if you want to get technical about it, <laughs> the new, te the new Testament, the new covenant doesn't begin until Jesus Christ rises from the dead. So you have books uh, that are called, what we call the new Testament. We have chapters in books that we call the New Testament, but it's sort of uh, giving you the pre-story to before the New Testament goes into effect. Having said all that, that means technically John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet. So there's that. But anyway, him and Paul have a very similar commission, and John's job is to prepare the people by speaking to them and baptizing them. Okay, so look at Matthew 3. Matthew 3, 
In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We are not going to get into the differences between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, but I assure you there there are differences. And there is some overlap there that I cannot readily explain. There's two basically two thoughts. One is that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same, and that doesn't explain everything. And there's some verses that say the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are different. And that doesn't explain everything. I digress. And saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way the Lord make his path straight. So so it's not, John just did, did, didn't take this upon himself to start saying this thing. That John is the guy, right? And that same John had his, had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Where am I at? Yeah. And they all went out of Jerusalem and out of Judea and all the region about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, i tell you what, we're, we're, we're going to chase this. I am running out of time already, but we're going to chase this because it's worth chasing. We're going to look, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to look back at Mark one because the, you know, your Bible is very precisely written and words mean things. And when men, when men start thinking that words mean thing, words don't mean things, or words don't mean the things that they mean, you get yourself often, often bad, bad trouble. We're going to address a very common heresy, and we're not. We, we may touch upon where it's usually taught out of, but but right here in Mark one, uh, verse four, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance. For the remission of sins. Okay? Stick your finger there and jump over to Acts 2. And while you're on Acts 2, I want you, I want you to think about something. So John the Baptist is baptizing people in the River Jordan. And he is saying, or the Bible says that he's, they're, they're being baptized for the remission of sins. Well, if for the remissions of sins means, so, for, okay, for is a word, F-O-R is an English word that can mean different things depending on how it's used, where it is in the sentence. It, it, it's got five or six different ways you could use it. Sometimes it means in order to obtain, right? I'm going to the store for eggs. I'm going to the store in order to obtain eggs. I don't have eggs. I need eggs. I'm going to go to the store. That's where they got them. I'm going to go to the store for eggs, okay? Sometimes it means because of. Man gets a, uh, goes to jail for stealing. He doesn't go to jail so he could steal. He goes to jail because he stole. So we know here in Mark chapter 1 that John is baptizing for the remission of sins. Well, did John's baptism wash people's sins away? Because if it did, then what in the world is Jesus going to the cross for? Right? We could have just kept on. John could have appointed some guys. John could have trained up some guys. We could be some baptizing fools. Right, Alexander Campbell. So if you get a if you get a group of people that teaches you, however well meaning they may be, that baptism washes away your sins, they don't know how to read. So in so in Mark chapter uh, one, John is baptizing people for the remission of sins. In other words, because their sins are remitted. Right, not not in order to obtain remission of sins, but because their sins are remitted. Now we can go, we can chase that right by about what it means to have your sins remitted. But just just go with me here. So for the remission of sins, Mark, for the remission of sins, we know that those sin that John's baptism did not wash away sins; that they did it in order to uh, because because of of the remission of sins. Acts chapter two. Uh, where am I at? Now, see, I, I'm running my mouth here. Where is it at? Repent ye be baptized for remission of sins. It's somewhere in Luke 2, or Acts 2. 2.38, I think is where it's at. Uh, yep, and Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So I submit to you that since it didn't mean in order to obtain remission of sins in John 1, or Mark 1, it doesn't mean in order to obtain remission of sins in Acts 2. Okay, so John's baptism didn't wash away sins because if it did, then, then you know, 
what's the purpose of, of, of Christ going to the cross. But it is interesting that according to Matthew 3, confessing their sins was part of that preparation. So, so John is preparing people, and the way he prepares people is by speaking to them and baptizing them. And according to Matthew 3, that was accompanied by their, them confessing their sins to John. Look, look Matthew 3. We'll look at it again. Matthew 3. Uh, let's see, five, verse 5. Then went he out in Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, so far so good. Look at verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. So fruits that meet for repentance. M-E-E-T means they meet, they means they match. So if a guy says he repented of uh, being the town drunk, then you should see him sober after that. That's proof that he really did have a change of heart and a change of direction. His fruits, his life should line up with the thing that he tells you he repented of. Okay? Not rocket science. But here's what, here's what you need to understand. People were coming to John, and some of them wanted to skip right past the part that nobody could see, the repentance, and they wanted to get right to the part where everybody could see. Everybody can see you being baptized. People can't see your repentance. So they want to skip past that, the part everybody could see. And John had no time for that nonsense. He tells them that the works, their works have to meet up uh, with their repentance. Look at Luke 3. I feel like we were just there. Maybe we weren't. Luke 3. It says, once again, our favorite phrase here. And he came in all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Okay? Uh, as is written the prophet, the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make, uh, make his path straight. Every valley should be filled, and every mountain and hill should be brought low, and the crooked should be made straight, and the rough way should be made smooth. Now, we could do a whole thing about when that verse gets fulfilled but not right now and all flesh will see the salvation of god then he said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him "O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth therefore uh fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourself we have abraham to our father for i have said to you that god is able of these stones to raise up children unto abraham and now also the axe is laid on the root of the trees every tree therefore which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire and the people asked him, saying, what shall we then do? So John refused to baptize people who hadn't repented and who didn't have some fruit to show that they'd repented. It's due, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is interesting. Uh, uh, when the publicans come to John in verse 12, uh, he tells them to you know quit robbing people because that's, that's what they need to repent of. And the, yeah, and the, the proof of their repentance is they don't rob people anymore. And in verse 14, the soldiers uh, likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So it just shows that military guys, even back then, they sat around and complained all the time. You see, nothing ever changes. But it is. I have a little note here. You know, it says, Do violence to no man. I got that circle, and I got a little handwritten note that says, But they're soldiers. Violence is what they do. Anyway. So, so in verse 10 through 14, that, that repentance has to meet up with, with, with what your sin is, or John's not going to mess with you. John's not going to get on at the time of day for you. John's not a guy to compromise in order to draw a crowd, and John's not a guy that's afraid to preach about the sin that's going on right in front of him, the stuff he knows about. Man, that's tough. That's tough stuff, man. That's tough stuff. We go out and preach, and I try... Uh, I don't man, it's tough. It's tough. You're at a gay pride parade, and uh, I mean, it's it's right there, right? You're gonna not. And I know people say, "Well, I'll preach against sin, but I won't preach against sins." Man, you got you got to play that the way you see it. But I, I think an argument can, an argument can be made 
for either direction. You see John the Baptist calling out individual people's situations and addressing them. You see uh, Jesus doing the same thing. You see Paul uh, chiding people for their superstition. You see him in church letters chiding uh, uh, church people for, for their foolishness and for their, for their carnality. Not afraid to address the situation at hand. And, you know, that, that tendency in John the Baptist gets him in trouble later on, uh, but it also gets him a commendation from Jesus. So, so we know John's baptism came with some pre-qualifications, and we know that it didn't wash away sins, because the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what did John's baptism do? I mean, what's the point of it? Well, it's got a couple of different points. Let's look at John 1. We are not going to get everything said that I wanted to say about old John, I don't think, but it'll be all right. Uh, John 1, um, I'm in John 11, that's not going to do us any good. John 1. Some of you have heard me preach in person. And I feel bad for you. And you know that this is exactly how I am when I'm in person. Uh, John 1. Look at verse 23, looks like. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which, said, which were sent to the Pharisees, and they asked him and said, Why baptize thou then, if thou not be that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? So, so the, 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 when John's out there doing his thing, the assumption by some people is that he's the Christ himself, but he's not. Uh, some people, uh, neither that prophet, which is interesting that they say neither that prophet. They're talking about the prophet uh, that, that Moses was promised, or Moses promised to the people that was that is the Messiah. So they've got, they got, the Pharisees don't know what they're talking about. They're, they're looking for three or four people to show up, and actually they should be looking for one guy to show up. And that's a, that's a common uh, problem in Judaism to this day. Uh, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. So that tells me Jesus is there in the crowd when he says this. He it is that is coming after me. It's preferred before me whose shoes latched I am not worthy to loose. And these things were done in Betharba beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John see Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bear record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So John's baptism uh, serves a couple of different purposes. Uh, one of the purposes is, um, um, well, it's, okay, the sequence of events here is that John is preaching and baptizing people. And while he's preaching, he predicts that there's somebody else that's coming. And God has told him to baptize people. And whoever on, whoever the, uh, the spirit descends upon like a dove, that's the Messiah. It's interesting that Jesus is his cousin and John does not appear to know until the baptism. That, that his cousin Jesus is the Messiah. So, so that dove descends, and then he tells the people, there's someone standing here today who's, I'm supposed to go before him, but he's greater than me, and I'm not even worthy to undo his shoes. And, uh, excuse me. And then the next time he sees Jesus, in verse 29 and verse 36, he points him out to everybody. So for John, personally, that ministry of baptism uh, revealed the Messiah to him and then put him in a position, position where he could reveal uh, the uh, the Messiah to the rest of Israel by pointing him out. But verse 31, and I knew him not, that, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water. So it's just be, so the Messiah is going to be revealed to Israel through the baptism of John. Um, but John's also Israel. You know, there's that. It doesn't say manifest to me, although, I mean, that happens. It says manifest to Israel. And a lot of stuff happens between the, the baptism of John and Calvary. 
But there were people. Um, so we're going to talk about the other thing that the baptism of John accomplishes. There were people baptized by John who, for whatever reason, they just weren't around for a lot of other stuff. You know, not everybody had the whole story. So there were people that came to John, it looks like. And I'll show you some of them in Scripture. Uh, they came to John. They said they confessed their sins. They repented their sins. They confessed their sins. John baptism. And then they went back home and, you know, you know, grew dirt for a living or whatever, whatever it was they did for a living. And so then all this other stuff happens and John goes around or Jesus goes around and heals the sick and raises the dead and then goes to the cross and dies. And and outside of Jerusalem uh, and rises from the dead, uh, these people that that had came from all over Israel to be baptized, they went back to where they came from and they didn't necessarily get the word. But because they. Because they had prepared to meet God. When they eventually heard the gospel. They believed it. Look at Acts 18. I I, I will freely concede if I've gotten some material stolen from somebody else. And a lot of what I'm giving you right now about the baptism of John, I owe to Nathan Irie and several, several discussions he and I had over the course about three or four years ago where he just looked at some stuff and he made a case. And I said, I don't know about all that. And he showed me the verses I'm about to show you. And I went, huh, I guess you're right. So there you go. Nathan, I doubt you're listening to this, but thank you. Where was that? Acts 18. Verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So Paulus is, I mean, he's hes a good guy. The Bible says a couple of nice things about him. But one of the things it points out is that all he knew was about the baptism of John. He didn't know about Calvary. He didn't know about everything that happened after the baptism of John. We began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of the Lord more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So here, Apollos is a guy that had gone to John, received the baptism of John, and then didn't get any information after that. But because his heart was prepared, when he heard the gospel, he received it. Look at Acts 19. And it came to pass while Apollos was at Corinth, verse 1, Paul, having passed to the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. That's interesting. He said to them, And what were you, then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Now, there's a lot can be said right there, but suffice to say that John's baptism, there's more, let's just say, there's more than one baptism, baptism in the Bible. And when 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 a Campbellite, Church of Christ guy, sees the word baptism, he automatically thinks water. And that's, you see right there, John's baptism is a different thing than Jesus' baptism, than the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Colossians. Maybe we'll do a thing on baptism one of these days. Uh, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much heard of whether or not there be any Holy Ghost. He said unto them, unto what were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon the Holy Ghost came upon them, they spake with tongues and prophesied. So here are some more people that all they, the last word they got was, go down there to where John is, confess your sins, repent. Show by proof of your life that your, 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 your repentance is backed up by your works, and John will baptize you. Here it is, three, four, five, six, seven years later. Hey, you guys heard about the, what happened with Jesus? And when they hear it, it clicks, it clicks, and they, and, and they get saved. That's wild stuff. So there are people there that, 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 that uh, heard Jesus preach but never got the baptism of John, and so it didn't click. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. So the, so, so the way you prepare the way of the Lord is you prepare yourself. You prepare your heart. 
to receive what God has to say to you, what God's going to explain to you. Man. So John's baptism not only revealed Jesus to John, but prepared the heart of the Jews to receive the gospel once they heard it. And, and it, I wouldn't be surprised. I can't prove this. This is one of my wack, wacky little theories. I would not be surprised if the thief on the cross that got saved, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd received John's baptism. I mean, he's hanging there. Looking next to him is a man who is beaten beyond recognition. And he says, Lord, <laughs> Oh, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Wild stuff. Back to Mark 1. We're, we're, we're trying to find a land spot here. Mark 1. we got to find a land spot because i got to go cook, cook supper. Mark 1. Yes, the podcast that's the real deal. Lucille. The podcast that's occasionally interrupted by goats baying in the, or dogs barking or household chores needing to be done. Uh, yeah. So Mark one verse six and John was, and we, we talked before about how, how, how John was coming. He fulfilled the role of Elijah. He said he, he was, Elijah's the next guy to show up and this, and he's supposed to say, prepare you the way of the Lord. And instead of Elijah showing up, John shows up, but check this out. Check, get your noodle around this one. Uh, Mark six. And John was clothed with uh, camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. So, so John's out there on the far side of River Jordan, and he's wearing a camel's hair and a, and a girdle of skin around his loins. Look, take a look at Second Kings. Going to roll back the pages of time here, and we are going to take a peek at our old buddy Elijah. Second Kings. I just it just rolled right past it. Second Kings. Second Kings uh looks like one. Right? Yep. Then Moab revealed against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Ahaziah fell down through the lattice in the upper chamber, which was in Samaria and was sick. He sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this disease. And you're in bad shape. You're going to talk to Beelzebub about whether or not when you're a Jew and you're going to talk to Beelzebub about what's going to happen next. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it not because there's not a god in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? So, so, so Elijah's just chilling at the house, to, to use a colloquial phrase. And these guys are on a mission. Uh, to go go inquire of some false prophet or some false god, and 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 God says, "Hey, Elijah, you need to get up and need to intercept these fellows and talk to them, and and ask them some hard questions." Uh, verse four. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord: Thou shalt not come down from that bed in which thou art gone up, but shall surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, "Why are ye now turned back?" And they said, "There came up a man to meet us, and said unto us, Go and turn to the king that sent you, and say unto him." Thus saith the Lord, is it not because there is a God, not in God in Israel that thou sentest to inquire of Baals above the God of Ekron? Therefore shalt thou not come down from that bed on which thou art gone out, but thou shalt surely die. They exactly quote Elijah. So it must have left quite an impression. So Elijah runs into him along the way and says, hey, you go tell the king he's going to die because he did this. Verse 7, he said, what manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered, he was a hairy man. And girt with a leather, a, a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. So when John the Baptist shows up, he shows up and he says the words that Elijah is prophetically supposed to say. And he wears the clothes that Elijah wore. Elijah was recognized by his clothes, and it's the same clothes as, as, as John the Baptist. And I've got a note here in my notes. Uh, so, you know, I. I uh, the whole thing about John being Elijah and there only being one coming to Christ. I, I don't know that I have a good enough grip on my own theory uh, to teach that. But in light of the end of the Malachi, the next thing uh, most folks are probably expecting is the, is the arrival of Elijah, uh, the forerunner of the Messiah. As a matter of fact, Orthodox Jews are still waiting for Elijah to show up. One of their things. So, so is John the Baptist Elijah? Or is he John? Or is he something else? Let's look at Matthew 11. Matthew 
Matthew 11. I keep feeling like we were here already. I don't know if people, if they're listening to this, if they actually sit down and have a Bible in front of them. I, I, I have no idea what you're doing. You could be here smoking a big bowl of something. I don't, I don't know what you're doing. But I think it would help you if you're not actually looking at the verses. But I could just say, you know, God knows what, like I just did. And uh, you should always check behind a guy. You should never take a man's a man's uh, word for it that if something says what he says it says, especially when your soul hangs in the balance. Matthew 11. <clears throat> and as, as they departed, verse 7, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what went you out into the wilderness to, to see? A reed shaking with the wind? What went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So, you know, Jesus makes fun of sissies that stay inside, wear soft clothes. Uh, but what went out ye out for to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare my, my, thy way before thee. Very last say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent taketh it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So, if you ask Jesus, is John Elijah? Jesus says, yes, but only if you believe. I mean, isn't that a wild thing to say? He either is or he isn't, right? He's either Elijah or he's not. But we've already covered that in according to Ephesians 3. Uh, God will shut your understanding off. So the people that, that had the understanding, they understood that John was, was Elijah for all intents and purposes. And so they were able to, to benefit from the ministry that Elijah slash John was going to do. Here, look, look at Luke 1. You think I'm making this up? Luke 1. They're able to benefit from the work that John was doing if they're willing to believe John. And if they didn't believe him and they didn't receive that baptism, then they can be standing there at the cross watching the crucifixion with their own eyes and they'll never understand what's going on right there in front of them. Luke 1. Verse... 13, I think is where we're starting. Yep, the angel said unto him, this is uh, him speak, this is, uh, speaking to John's uh, dad, who, by the way, was a Levite, which is interesting because his wife is Mary's cousin, and Mary is very much of Judah. So apparently you can marry outside your tribe, and I guess whatever, whatever the husband's tribe is, that's the tribe you're now part of. It's a whole other thing that I'm, I'm looking into. Uh, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayers heard and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear us thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, you know, neither should you, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. So the prophecy is that this guy, John, is going to go forth in the spirit and power of Elias. He's going to he's going to wear the same kind of clothes Elijah, Elias wore, and he's going to say the thing that Elias is supposed to say when Elias shows up. But look at Matthew. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he fulfills the last verse of Malachi. But look at Matthew 17, and this is where we're going to stop, because I really, I'm, I'm running out of time here. Matthew 17. I'm going to I'm going to end on a note where I don't even know my own theory that well. And after 6 days Jesus taken Peter, James and John his brother and bring them up into a high mountain apart. This is verse 1. And was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. 
Answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now, I forgot to cover the verse where they asked John, is he Elijah? And he says, no. <laughs> oh, man, the Bible is wild. So according to the, 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 according to the uh, angel, John is Elijah. According to Jesus, John is Elijah. According to John, not so much. But here, Elijah shows back up. We said, well, then he couldn't possibly be Elijah. Well, so it's like it's like Clark Kent and Superman, how you never see him in the same room at the same time. Because by the time this happens, John the Baptist is dead. Herod has had the man's cut, head cut off. And we'll cover that later on, because that's a wild story in itself. So, so let's say... The Bible says in a different place that uh, how John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. What in the world is that, right? I mean, I mean, you get the way you get filled with the Holy Spirit is you receive Christ as Savior. But apparently, John is in a different category because he's the last Old Testament prophet. I don't know what the rules are about John. John's John's just this thing. He's this he's this anomaly that shows up here at the beginning of your New Testament and does some stuff, and then drops off the scene, and he ain't gone five minutes or ten minutes or whatever. And Elijah is 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 around, but you never see those guys on the earth at the same time. Wild, wild stuff. But like I said, the reason you know that you're getting down to the wire in 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 the in the ministry. Uh, of the Messiah in, in in his capacity as as the one who's going to be cut off for the people is because John the Baptist slash Elijah shows up and says, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And depending on how what you did with that information determines what happens to you next. You imagine being at, being at the cross and watching Jesus Christ yield himself unto death, submit himself unto death, even the death of the cross, you're standing right there. You're an eyewitness to it. And you go home, and you make yourself a sandwich, and you take a nap, and 10 years goes by, and 15 years goes by, and you drop dead, and you're standing before Jesus Christ, the one you saw crucified. But because of your heart condition, you didn't see it. You didn't see it. Maybe in our soul winning efforts, maybe our prayer ought to not be so much, uh, I don't know, maybe our prayer ought to be that people's hearts will be prepared so that when we go to preach to them, they'll receive the things we say. Well, that is Mark Lesson 2. I'm going to run and go take care of some other stuff. Y'all have a good time doing whatever you're doing, and uh, I will see you on the other side.